Our last speaker today is going to talk to us about employee development. And our final speaker for today is Margie Wright McGowan. Margie is an inspirational leader with a proven track record of delivering results in complex environments. Currently, she is the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy and Human Resources Officer at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. She was also recently promoted to oversee communications, public information, and engagement. So, wow, Margie, you, you wear a lot of hats. It's very impressive. Margie, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your knowledge with us. Well, thank you. Can everyone, oh good, I can, you can hear me mic'd up, thank you. Um, well, clearly I brought a cheering section, which I'll advise you as a strategy if you're gonna do a talk. So I want to take a second and acknowledge my amazing colleagues at the Federal Reserve. Are you saying they can't hear me? Oh, double, okay. Um, I wanna acknowledge my amazing colleagues at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. If you guys could stand up, please. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about a lot of really practical tools and topics. And the reason that I want, I want to acknowledge the team, and we have a proud Zip, Aaron Lewis, proud Zip alumni. I want to make sure I acknowledge, yes. Um, as a proud Bobcat, I could only go so far in my posting, I couldn't write go Zips, but go Aaron, go Aaron. Um, so the reason I wanted to make sure I introduce the team is not only they do all the real work, but they're available if you have specific questions, as am I, about the practical stuff we're gonna show. And I've gotten permission from my head of communications. I'll share everything um, when we're done so you don't have to take pictures unless you want to. Um, we'll make sure we share everything because we do serve the public and it's our goal to try to do everything we can. We're all in this together. While I have a, a suite of responsibilities, I'm a lifelong HR person, um, an HR person at heart. I love the work. But we do tell, where's Jackie? Yes. So you love people, you love it. Like, oh, that'll change a little bit, but you go, it'll be fine. <laughs> it'll be fine, I love your enthusiasm. So we're gonna talk today about employee development and we're gonna talk specifically, am I doing something? Just so loud. Um, we're gonna talk about developing the employees that will help improve your organizational capability and retain, right? So life is different and has been different since you know, the pandemic, I think I'm doing, here we go. And so I wanna make sure that we give you practical tools on how to, you know, address the evolving needs of the organization. I also am a smart HR lady and I brought prizes. So if you participate, you will likely win some Fed gear and it's some cool stuff. So Teresa's gonna help me hand that stuff out, but participate and maybe get a mug or a blanket. So um, I stand on the shoulders of Arlene and Mary who started us off in such a beautiful format. We all didn't realize we were gonna work so well together, but I think my, my talk will kind of dovetail nicely into their work. But about me, so the opposite of Arlene, I'm an extreme extrovert. Um, I'm like a Labrador puppy. Like if you can give me enough love and attention, it makes me really happy. Um, but my world are these three people in front of you. So um, you know, if we talk about employee development, it's personal. Right, so I'm gonna personally share what motivates me and how I decide what career decisions I'm gonna make. And it's certainly different than when I started my career a long time ago. So Roger McGowan, the handsome boy on the left, he's a junior at St. Edwards. Um, his hair is similar to his mother's, as you can see. It's crazy and he loves it, like as much hair as he can have, he loves. Susie next to me uh, was just graduating from St. Joe's and is now at Boston University. And thank God coming home this weekend for fall break. So I'm super excited to see her and just get my arms around her. And then Jim McGowan, um, I met 31 years ago, our first day at OU, and we just celebrated 25 years. So it's a great, yeah. So I have a good life. Um, but anyone that knows me, works with me, works for me, my boss, they know at this point in my career, everything I'm doing is really focused in on my family, providing for them, having flexibility for them, and then also sharing the knowledge that I've been able to gather through my career and kind of helping the next generation of leaders. So when I talk about my own development planning, it's always centered around those things. And the best way we know to develop people is through learning and understanding what motivates them where they are right now meeting them where they are. And we're gonna talk about that and how we help our managers do that. Now first, Teresa's probably like, you've waited way too long to say this. 
The ideas that I represent today are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland <laughs> or the Federal Reserve System. I say that because I think you just heard I have two private school tuitions to pay and I need to keep my job. So <laughs> if I say some charming little anecdote or I get a little off track, those are my views. But I will tell you that every single thing I'm gonna share with you, and unlike Arlene, I share as many pictures of my kids as possible. So you wanna see me on the break? I got some pictures of Susie at BU. But um, everything I'm gonna share with you today, we've done at the Fed. Now, with some levels of success from the beginning, the middle to the end, but everything we have, we're, we're sharing, we've done. And the reason we've done it is because people are our resources. So if you're familiar with the Fed at all, um, you know, we, we supervise banks, we develop monetary policy, I'm not gonna discuss interest rates, um, but people are our assets. They are our product. And so we have to invest in them and we're not that big. So there's 12 banks, we have about 1,100 people in our district, so um, that's Cleveland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, part of Kentucky. And so we have to make sure that we keep our talent motivated and retained because when we lose someone, the knowledge transfer, I'm looking at our, our talent acquisition team, it's a really big deal, it's really hard to backfill them. So, all right, I said I've been an HR lady for a long time, I won't go into how many years, but a long time. There's always a new phrase. There's always new buzzwords, right? So we've got the great reshuffle, we've got the great resignation, the great attrition. Basically, what I think we've all experienced, especially since 2020, is that the rules are changing. What employees want and what they expect is very different. And unlike when I first started where it was, you know, hey, you know, you get what you get and you don't get upset, that's not how it works. And our managers, who are the ones that are supposed to be the center of this development experience for our employees, they need more help than ever because they're not used to these new rules of engagement. And so what happens is people tend to say, well, it's HR's job. Well, HR's in charge of development. Well, HR has a program. And we all know that that's not a sustainable model. We need our managers to be able to support the employees and we need employees to own their own development. That sounds really great though, so how, how are we gonna do it? Let's start with some fun facts. So McKinsey did a study in 2022. They surveyed about 13,000 people. They developed 12 drivers to determine why do people quit. These are the top three. None of you that have done this for more than 15 minutes are gonna be surprised, but I'm still gonna share because I think some of the language choices are relevant. Lord. Okay, here we go. And I want to do a shout out for Joan Phelan, who's at home sick but watching. She did this beautiful presentation, so thanks, Joan. But the building is going to be a challenge for me, I'm certain of it. Um, okay, so we're just not going to build, we're going to go with all three. All right. So, first of all, I want to draw your, your attention to the words uncaring and uninspiring leaders. Think about those word choices. So, if you think back even seven years ago, was caring a word that we used all the time? Was inspiring a word we used all the time, right? It was more command and control, get your work done, be glad you have a job. You know, it wasn't, hey, I want a leader that meets me where I'm at, that cares about my well-being, that knows me as a human. It just, it wasn't, it wasn't a requirement. So if you're a manager, that role has changed too for you and how you engage with your employees. Compensation, I'm looking at my comp leader. Comp is a detractor. People are, you rarely say, oh my gosh, I love my salary increase. Thank you so much. I just, I wish I'd gotten that 3.2% instead of three, but thank you, you know? So that's not always gonna inspire people, but it is a reason that they will often say, hey, I'm not happy with what I'm getting paid. I firmly believe after all these years that people at that point, their head's already out of the game and compensation's an, you know, an easy thing to say. But lack of career development and advancement is far and ahead above. And we know this at the Fed as well. So when things started to get really rough after the pandemic and we were really worried about our employees, we started doing state interviews. How many of you have done state interviews? Okay, who wants to be brave to say what a state interview is? You get a mug. Way in the back, of course, the first person is so far back. Yes, what is a state interview? Yes, exactly right. The other benefit, and see what you missed if you didn't volunteer, they're staying the steel, they're nice. 
Do not put them in the dishwasher. Um, so, and I, you, I'm good for it. Here, this one's, oh, come on up, grab it. Um, so the other good thing about stay interviews is that it makes people feel good that you're talking to them. Like you want them to stay, so it's double. You get intel and they're like, hey, I'm important. They want me to stay. So when we did stay interviews, we did listening sessions, we heard that our employees were really disappointed and we were shocked. Thanks for being first. We were shocked. They didn't feel there was transparency around development. They didn't understand what the development plans were. And so when I saw this stat, I said, yeah, we, we've experienced that here at the Fed. Our other two issues were unique. They were communication and they were driving accountability. What it's worth, that's what's going on at the Fed. So as we talk about our greatest asset, so we, we think, okay, so we could lose really good, smart people. So for us, economists, cash workers, and I'll get to that a little bit later, um, HR people, IT people, we're going to the cloud, right? Like all the stuff, you know, payments executives. We could lose these people because they think they don't have a good development plan. They don't see opportunities. They don't see a clear path for themselves. And it was even worse for our minority employees. They felt transparent. They thought it was all kludgy, right? We don't know how to get where. We don't know how people are getting promoted. We don't know the rules. So you think about that. So much of that is in our control. We're the people, right? We create the structures. We create the jobs. We sit down with, with leaders and say, hey, have you thought about this workforce plan? So we, we thought about, OK, how do we tackle this with education? with programs, but also just good old fashioned workforce planning and making sure people knew what was possible, how they could get there, holding up the people that had done it successfully, and really changing the messaging around employee development. The thing I wanted to hit on in this one is the plant your roots. So I'm a firm believer that someone that's happy, that feels good, that feels they have a great culture, that feels like they can operate in a world where they feel safe, they're not gonna return the call, right? Getting a new job is a pain. It's a lot of work, it's risk. So if you get your employees, their hearts, their minds, you get them engaged, you have a much better shot of keeping them and having them not take that call, planting their roots. Now I'll tell you, we don't have a tenure problem at the Fed at all, but we do have an emerging talent retention challenge like all of us. You know, a pension isn't going to keep everybody, right? Not everyone wants to do mission-oriented work. And some people just want to come in for three to five years, have it be a mutually beneficial relationship, and head on their way. So we had to be more creative in how we employ approached employee development. OK. There's also some word choices I want to talk about on this slide. So if you think about the evolving employee, and I'll tell you, there are times when I feel a little bit like old lady get off my lawn about the employee challenges, like, really, is that really a thing? Like, are we really upset about that? Do we really need that? And then I think, okay, times have changed. Their options have changed. Good employees are more valuable than ever, right? They have more options than ever. But if you think about the change of the mindsets, and this is where I think Arlene and Mary did such a great job, what people want and what they need and what they care about has changed. People will leave a job with no job. People will say, hey, I'm gonna just you know, do with less or I wanna feel fulfilled or I don't belong. Those are new trends and new challenges for our managers. How do you manage that? How do you relate to an employee that you can't really relate to and you may have nothing in common with and try to engage them and more importantly, understand what they want, what they need, and where they want to go. And we've all had the employee that says, well, I just want to contribute. just want to feel meaningful. I just want to do good work. And then you give them your performance review and their salary, and they're like, I want to get promoted. I want to make more money. I want to be in leadership. And you're like, well, I didn't know any of that. So these managers, they sit down, and they try to think about how they're going to approach these employees. And they look at all these changes. And oh, by the way, a lot of the employees aren't even here. They're not in the building. The old grab the late worker, they're going to be a, you know, a whippersnapper, we're going to give them the cool assignments, or you can see what people are contributing. That's changed. And so how we help our managers lead and develop in this new environment is our challenge. Because we trust them to do it ultimately. It's their responsibility, but we're going to need to help them get there. All right, so now I'm going to talk about Gen Z. 
my friend Jackie, I'm going to pick on you the whole time, but you're so charming, I don't think you'll mind. Um, so if you think about the introduction now, and the Gen Zs, the oldest are 26. So you know they're just getting into the to work environment. They are going to change everything. What they need is so different. What they want is so different, and we want them. We have a workforce now where we have four generations working together. And if you're a baby boomer, you might struggle managing a Gen Z employee. You might struggle sitting down and having a development conversation with them because you can't relate to them on so many levels. But if we don't close that chasm and help our managers with those discussions, we'll lose that talent. And frankly, that's the talent that seems a little easier to retain because they want development. They'll stay for development. They'll stay for upskilling. They'll stay to learn more. Those are, that's free stuff. Like we can offer them that for free. That's not a 6% increase. That's, hey, I'm gonna get better. I wanna try new things. I wanna do new things. They want a career path. They want to know how I'm going to specifically get there. They want to see people that have done it. They want to see people like them that have done it. And so as we think about this next generation and how we have to attract them and how we have to retain, retain, retain them, we have to start with having the managers that lead them be capable of meeting them where they are and knowing and understanding them. And we heard some great advice from Arlene and Mary on that, on having the conversations, investing the time, Sitting down when you want to be at your computer like I want to do, and everyone here that works with me and for me know that I'm the worst at sitting here listening to you and doing this the entire time. And I think in my mind, because I'm a mom, that that's working. That multitasking and semi-listening, because they're getting to physically be in front of me, that I'm doing them a favor. And in reality, I'm probably frustrating them more than if I had just not met with them. So how we meet people, what we do, the changing employee expectations, they're all real. And you're probably like, okay, well, that's not new, Margie, we know all that. How many people in this room are either Gen, who's a Gen Z? First one I saw, all right, you get a blanket. <laughs> it's super cozy too, here you go. And it's got like Velcro, so there you go. Put it in your car, it's safe. Um, and how many people like me have a lovely girl that was on that screen that are parents of a Gen Z? Okay, I won't ask if anyone's a grandparent of a Gen Z, um, but I know you're out there. Um, so think about that. Like, what is the most important thing? What's your name, sir? John. Welcome, John. Uh, you look very spiffy, too, by the way. Um, John, what's the most important thing to you in your career development? Yeah, like what are you looking for? What's important to you? Yeah, I think. Okay. And do you kind of know already what you want to do? Yeah. You do. What do you want to do? Nice. Okay. I like it. Um, so that's another thing. A lot of Gen Z folks are more in tune with what they want to do. Like they have ideas. They've watched people. They've learned. They're on the phones all the time. They see everything that's available. Um, and so this is a generation we're going to have to, we're going to have to change the way we think for. All right, so bringing it home on why. We all know why. If we create, it's just going to be this way for me. Um, if we create this culture of employee development, right, Everyone's going to win. People are going to have job satisfaction. They're going to feel they have advancement opportunities. They're going to increase engagement. And they're more likely to stay grown productive. Sounds good, right? So it's a business case. Perfect. Well, Margie, what if I don't have opportunities for them? What if people don't leave my organization? What if people think they're ready and they're not? What if my organization says, hey, you know what? We're not we're no more promotions. I don't want to change the organizational model. I'm the HR person. I can't make them do that. So what am I going to do? This sounds great. But at the end of the day, a lot of business leaders, they're set in the direction, and we're out there, and we're supporting them. So how can this practically work? Well, we're going to have to get more creative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about some practical things we've done at the Fed to try to address some of those exact issues. Because I can tell you, all the folks over here have heard every one of those complaints, have heard every one of those arguments, and we've needed to work around it. Development's going to have to be intentional. Okay, It's going to have to be intentional, and it's going to have to be manage managers and employees partnering with HR support. Okay, We're all going to have to be in this together. 
And more than ever, it's going to have to be personal and it's gonna require some conversations, some digging, some, some agility because things change, right? What I wanted to do 20 years ago is not what I want to do right now. What I wanted to do five years ago isn't what I want to do. John's going to want to do maybe something different in two years, right? We don't know. Maybe Jackie's going to say, I'm going to go supply chain because HR is exhausting. So we don't know, but we need to know now where you're at and how do we meet you there. So one of the things we do at the Fed is the 70-20-10 model. We like numbers. Of course we do. We have a lot of economists that work there, um, a lot of analytical people. And I'll tell you what it's like sometime to be an extrovert and come work with a lot of analytical introverts. It is a development opportunity. So it's been that for me. So wh what this means is, you know, this is, again, not rocket science. OK, but how do we structure a development plan so that the majority of it is you're doing the stuff, right? And I want to think, who asked about agility, agile earlier? Someone asked about agile. Thank you, Arlene. So let's say you want, to be, you want to do more agile programming planning, right? You so, it sounds good, sounds great. You have no technical knowledge, really, or training of that. So why wouldn't you make sure you got a couple training courses under you so you knew what the heck you were doing, but you got thrown into a project or a team where you could actually do the work? That's the model we try to use at the Fed. Right, so we're gonna, we all have the, the training junkies that have been like, I've been to this training class and this training class and this training class, and still I'm not a manager. Hey, well, you've never even led a meeting. Just because you've gone to a training class doesn't mean you can go out and lead anybody. It just means you've theoretically learned how to lead. So what we do is we try to sit down with the, with the manager and walk them through, okay, what is a framework that you could use to try to craft a development opportunity that has this balance. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do an example up here. I'm gonna, I have it in my head. I wrote it down, but we'll see how it does when I'm wearing the skirt and bending on this thing, but we're going to try. So the point of this is to help the employee understand that all the training in the world isn't going to necessarily develop you. You're not going to be very effective in a rotation or a, a assignment if you haven't had any of that training. And you need coaching. You need advocacy. You need someone that says, hey, you know what? You're not being very civil. Or Margie, that the skirt comment probably was a dumb idea, right? Or like, you need someone that set, helps you along the way learn the things that you're just not going to learn in that class. So we try to focus on the 70, 20, 10. And I'll give you some examples on how we do it. All right, so this is just a piece of a framework that we have. But every one of you, I'm sure, in your organization can put something. Oh. See, it goes so fast. Thank you for telling me, Arlene. OK. So <laughs> hold on. Like, and this is a money slide. I want this to just stay. I'm going to put this down. OK. <laughs> All right, we're going to be agile. Um, so in the 70s slide, <laughs> you would see a bunch of examples of different things that you could do. So you would see, for instance, you could be a member of an RNG, an affinity group, an EAG, what different people, different organizations call it different things. I'm going to try one more thing. Time probably won't work. All right. So learning by doing. So we have at the... It's OK. I'm going to just give up. I'm going to give up, or it's going to go through the whole thing. Um, so what are some organizations you could join, right? People mistake EAGs, or employee resource groups, or affinity groups, as like clubs or ways to get together. They are tremendous leadership opportunities. They are opportunities to go in and lead a group, right, where you have no power, so you're leading by influence in a matrix kind of world. And you have to go in, and you have to build consensus, different levels, different functions, right? So a huge opportunity. You can do what we call a system project. So the Federal Reserve System is 12 banks. You can do a project outside of your area. So in different organizations, it could be a division, a different division, a different plan to different you know, part of the organization. You could go and say, hey, you know what? I've got some extra time. So we have what's called for my career. And it's basically free labor. So if a big project's going on, or there's a big, you know, a team needs some little extra help, 
they'll post out on our, our website, hey, we have this opportunity. Now, the employee does it along with their job, right? But they're able to go and engage in another part of the organization and get experience that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten. And people know that because it's a learning opportunity, you're not going to get someone that's 100% baked, but you're getting someone that's going to be helping you, and it's an extra set of hands. You can also say, hey, you know what? I'm going to go and take on a project that I've identified that we haven't assigned anyone to, but I see it's a need, and so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to volunteer for that. So you get the idea, right? You get the idea that you are going out and you're providing people with on the job, go to shadow, all the things we've talked about, one opportunity, and list those. Have those available for your managers. So when they sit down right here, why don't we talk about this option? Have you thought about this option? Learning from others. And I'll talk about it in a minute. We've created a sponsorship and a mentoring program, hugely successful, hugely, free, free. Mentors win, mentees win, the sponsorship program is focused on minority talent, where we pair a senior leader with a talented minority employee for advocacy, for visibility, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but free, people get a chance to step out of their own organizational unit and help and support someone else, or we'll just see someone that's kind of struggling a bit. A manager will come to us and say, hey, this person is, you know, they're, they're not leading courageously or they're struggling a little bit with inclusive leading. Okay, we're gonna find someone that can help support in that area. And then, of course, you have technical training, of course. So I think about it, and I'll sit down with managers, and I'll say, OK, so let's say, so John, you want to be a financial advisor, analyst, something financial. OK, so John wants to do this. He wants to be in finance. So he probably needs to have some analytical skills, right? He probably needs to have a little bit of management reporting skills. He may need to know what workday or... SAP, or I don't want to favor anyone, PeopleSoft, whatever, all they are now. Um, he probably wants to have um, some business leader relationships, okay? Does John have a mentor? Is John going and leading any meetings? So what meetings is he attending? Is he at an EAG, right? Okay. Um, have we seen that John leads inclusively, just in his day-to-day, -day, or leads from where he's at. So at Cleveland Fed, we say you need to lead from where you are. It doesn't matter whether you lead people or not. You need to lead from where you are. We expect everyone to lead. If you have the opportunity to step up, say something, make a difference, create a cultural impact, we expect that of you. So is John demonstrating that? So you literally sit down with a piece of paper. You talk about where John is now. You talk about where John needs to be. So let's say John's, he's analytical, right? But he's had no management reporting. He doesn't have a lot of business leader relationships. And we haven't, he doesn't have a mentor right now. All right, so I'm gonna go to my HR partner, right? I'm the manager. I'm gonna go to my HR partner and I'm gonna say, okay, is there any way we can get John in the mentoring program? Is there any classes right now or someone he could partner with that's done, has done a lot of, what did I say? Management reporting work? Is there examples of where we had outstanding that he could sit in? Could he sit in a board meeting maybe? Could he sit in a leadership team meeting? Could he see how it's done? You get where I'm going, right? You go back and you sit down with John and you have a real plan. You have a real plan and you have things that you can deliver. You can deliver. And then you can follow up. You can see how it's going. John's exposed to other people, so you're getting feedback from other individuals. Yes, it takes time. Yes, it takes a little work, and it takes some negotiating, it takes talking to business leaders. But in that moment, John feels as if you've invested in him, you haven't spent one extra dime. You haven't promised John that he's going to go where he's going, but you've given him a roadmap and you've given him tools of how he can get there. All right, any questions so far? Okay. All right, our development philosophy at the Fed. I'm afraid now of this, so afraid. Um, so I said it a bit earlier, development is personal, and people have accountability for their own development. But everyone deserves development. Everyone deserves an opportunity. It doesn't matter if they want to be the CIO or they want to be a supervisor in cash. Everyone deserves the opportunity to have development. And so I'm going to have a chance for another prize 
This is a fancy notebook and a pen. You could have had it and been writing down all the smart things I'm saying. Who that doesn't work at the Fed could tell me what a cash worker is? Wow, not even guessing. For, oh, yep, sir. Yes, apparently you've written job descriptions for cash work. Come on up. Get your pen and paper. Okay. Really? I'm going to give it to you anyway. Thank you, Ryan. So uh, during the pandemic, our cash workers made sure that the economy kept going. These are literally people that are in a basement, no windows, they have to be double badged in and out. They don't have pockets on their pants. They can't take a drink in that's not clear. They go to the bathroom in pairs. I'm making it sound very attractive. Um, <laughs> they go through psychological testing before they do it. These are people that spend their entire day sorting, bagging, dealing with currency. I won't tell you how much money we have in the Fed, but it's an awful lot. And we move it all over the country. Brinks trucks come in. That's why we have the guys with the guns, right? These workers are essential. They didn't take a break during COVID. They didn't get to stay home. They masked up. They got free lunches. They got, you know, when they could have it, and they came into work every single day, and they kept the economy going. They are our lowest level employees. They, as you said, are very equivalent. They're a blue-collar worker, right? We have had so many success stories of people coming from cash and elevating into the Fed. And you know what? They care about development just as much as an IT worker cares about development. Development is for everybody, but it looks different for everybody. And you have to approach it different for everybody. So that's our philosophy at the Fed. You're a little bit of a cheater over there, I'm just going to say. <laughs> OK, so we've talked about managers, poor managers. Managers have so much on their plates, more than ever. We recently did a manager assessment. We moved some people out of management that it just wasn't their jam, right? And they wanted to, to be their jam, but it just wasn't going to be. And we put them in roles where they could be successful as individual contributors. And we elevated people where they were great at it. But being a manager is hard because I don't know a manager these days that doesn't have their own job, too. They want their own development. They're fighting for their career. They're looking at HR like everyone's afraid of HR, like, this is another thing I have to do. Come to me with your template. Come to me with your thing. i got to have development conversations. They may not even want to develop. They've been here forever, right? You hear it, right? And they're just, they're exhausted. And we're coming to them with something else they have to do. We have to help make it easier for them. Employee development doesn't have to be a huge burden. If you talk to, if we said to managers, talk to your employee once a month about their development for 15 minutes. I think that's what we asked. Do we say 15 minutes, Paula, for every once a month? 30, okay, I knew she'd say 30. She's a true HR person, 30 minutes. Think of how much time they'd be giving their employees. And it doesn't sound overly burdensome, right? 30 minutes. Break it apart bit by bit for them. Help them understand the impact of that. We're just for talking about your development for 30 minutes. We're not talking about you didn't do the spreadsheet. We're not talking about the fact that you've been kind of late. We're not talking about, you know, we're talking about what you want to do. Where do you want to go? What are you good at? What do you like? What do you see? What if, 30 minutes. I think 15 would suffice. But 30 minutes, think about how great that would be, the impact that would have. How do we get the managers to say, here's what I've done, or here's what's possible? So arming those managers is our top job. We've created programs for them. We've created training for them. I'm looking at the crew that's done it. We've tried to help them in every way we can. But sometimes we just have to sit down with them and help them see what's possible. All right, this is a program I'm super proud of. Who has a mentoring program at their organization? Saw you first, white sweater, glasses, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your mentoring program while I get your prize? Great. And um, do you have a lot of people that do it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Yep. Mm -hmm. I love that. So that's huge. That's a, so it does, a corporate person doesn't have to manage a corporate person. An IT person doesn't have to mentor an IT person, right? Cross pollination, cross experiences, cross interactions, right? That is powerful because you have an advocate, then you have another advocate. I think it's more powerful to have an advocate outside of your area of responsibility. Someone else that knows you, that talks about you. Here's your mug. Um, but I want to talk about our sponsorship program because I'm super proud of it and I see the clock is ticking. Good Lord. So we implemented, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I love your skirt. We implemented a sponsorship program specifically for minority talent, and I have a success story that I'm so proud of, I have to share very quickly. So we had an employee, a minority female, she was extremely talented, she was a little further down in the organization. One of our executives uh, was assigned as her sponsor, started working with her, started talking to her, started learning about her, started understanding her background. she come from another organization, had been with the Fed, I don't know, maybe 10 years. Once we dug into it, we found this individual had a CPA, a CIA, a CFA, it's a lot of C's and A's, right? I have none of those things, but they're all really important to an organization. We learned that she'd had experiences we didn't even know about. So that executive said, hey, I'm, I'm getting this person out, right? Like I'm pulling them out of this organization and finding another place where they can shine. Did not happen overnight. Some orchestration had to occur, partner with HR, partner with the business. A role was established where the person could thrive, contribute a new level, they killed it. Year and a half later, here comes another opportunity. We think this person would be great at. She has more exposure now. People have seen more what she can do. People are saying, yeah, let's pick that person. Let's pick, yes, what about her? What about her? Long story short, this woman ends up on three succession plans. She ends up leading a finance organization. This is an individual that if it hadn't been for a sponsorship program may very well still be a hidden, unused gem in our organization. And we are better off now because of that. So is she. But at the end of the day, we won. We had her in three different roles, a minority female talent. There's so many opportunities here. It's free. I keep saying free because I know budgets are tight. I know things cost. I highly recommend a sponsorship program. Okay, internal mobility. This is a huge, huge issue for, we heard from our employees. People don't see what's possible. They don't think it's transparent. Why do some people move? I don't move. How do I get there? This is where we really need to make sure that the perception is not the reality. The same people don't get picked for all the jobs. We broaden our exposure. We have more talent conversations talent conversations at the lowest level. The Cleveland Fed, we talk about everyone to the lowest level. We do a talent review. We may not spend tons of time on every person, but everyone gets a discussion. You do that so you see what's available and you try to pull people out that you don't normally have visibility to and people can see what's possible. People wanna see that folks like them have done something different. They wanna see that opportunities exist. We need to make sure that our managers know this is a big part of their job. We need to give them easy questions that they can ask people. We need to have them dig around into their background so that you learn, hey, this person has this talent. I didn't know about it. They've done this job before. I didn't know about that. And then we need to make sure that we're clear on internal opportunities. We all know the slate system. We all know, oh, I have this person in mind. But the more we can create transparency and visibility to how you progress, or how you move sideways, because that's something else we've had to really focus in on in the Fed, because we're not that big. How do you move sideways? It's not always up. We've got a long runway. I'll say to people all the time, it is a marathon, not a sprint. Like, you have a long way still to work. Why don't we try to some side opportunities? Why don't we see what this is there? But we have to make sure that people understand what's possible, and people like to do different things. When I first came to the Fed, I would find that people were in jobs for like five, seven, ten years. I'm like, oh my lord. Like, anyone would be tired of a job at that point. How can you possibly be getting the best out of people? Even if you rotate across. But we have to be brave with our leaders too. Sit down and, and help them understand this is important to the success of your business. You may love your current structure. It may feel really safe. Sally may have been doing the job seven years and she's forgotten it by now. She knows it so well. And that feels good to you. Eventually, it won't feel good to Sally. But more importantly, it won't feel good to Tommy, who's waiting for Sally's job and sees it's never going to be possible for him because she's not going anywhere. All right. Quiet hiring. Really, 
summary of all I've been saying, right? We've got quiet, qu I mean, quiet quitting, quiet firing is an old HR lady. I can't even process these things. Like, I'm just gonna ignore people and hope that they leave, or hey, I'm just gonna sit at my desk and put my head down. Um, or what do they call it, the lazy girl five o'clock? I hated that, that's a new trend that's out there too. But quiet hiring is everything we're talking about, right? It's taking the talent you have. It's like when we clean our closet, and you're like, I didn't know I had that skirt. Man, I forgot I had these sweaters. Like, it's like I went shopping, right? Your, your talent is there. Are you optimizing them? Do you know what they're capable of? Have you thought about what else they can do? Because someone else will. LinkedIn is the most wonderful and scariest thing ever for an HR person. Everyone's stuff's out there. Everyone's posting how great they are, what they've done, what they've certification they've gotten. It's just like, it's just advertising to the masses. Pick me, I'm available, I'm out there. If you're not looking at what they're doing, someone else is. Quiet hiring. I talked about this, and I'm out of time. Okay, career framework. This sounds scary, it's not. Chrissy and Carol, can you stand up, please? Where are you, Chrissy and Carol? Chrissy Rovat, Carol Lavelle, total rewards team at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, they're outstanding. You can sit down now, thank you. Um, <laughs> no mugs for you, you have mugs. We've created a career framework at the Fed. It sounds scary, they're probably like, it is hard, Margie, it is complicated, right? But it doesn't, you don't have to make it complicated. What it does is, a lot, and I said their names because if you want to find them, ask them questions, they'll, they'll tell you everything they know. What it does is it creates, again, that transparency, that visibility for employees of what's possible. Here's the career tracks, right? Am I gonna be professional, senior, entry level, right? What are the job families? HR, communications, cash, IT. What levels fall on that, and what's the salary? This is not rocket science. A lot of us HR people have done this forever, but the clearer you make it, the more transparent you make it, the more people use it, right? It's not just something, we used to create these in binders. They sit in binders, I remember. Make it a part of managers' lives, help them understand it, help them know how to use it, and then make it a tool for employees. This isn't an HR tool, this is an employee tool. We've done that and it's given us great success at the Fed. Okay, so I've touched on a lot of these things. The most important thing in employee development is connecting, helping our managers, arming them with tools, arming them with tactics, but being there with them to teach them to fish, right? You teach them to fish, then you step back. HR shouldn't be a part of the development conversations. They shouldn't be leading the development conversations. You can do one or two to teach them, but the manager has to have that relationship with the employee. So these, I'm not gonna go through, but just an example of how simple the conversations can be. You can do it with the legal pad. You can help your, sit down with your, say managers, just for your half hour, just answer a couple of these, okay? Then we'll have the information we need to go to the next step. Okay. I like this slide because my favorite thing is to say it's a journey. Good Lord. Okay. So John and Jackie, I'm going to pick on you. John and Jackie, isn't that great? Um, I'm so excited for you because you're starting out. You're starting out and you don't even know where you're going to be. And I wish I, I, was old, I wasn't so old, I won't get to see probably where you will be, be, but it's a marathon, not a sprint. And development is personal, like I started. Why is it personal? Because people want different things at different times. When I was John and Jackie's age, I wanted to make a lot of money, I wanted to do a lot of important things, and I wanted to you know, go out after work, like that sounded fun, you know, like I wanted to be cool. Now. <laughs> Now, as you noticed, I was the only one whose people didn't have dinner memories from last night. I didn't go to the dinner, right? I'm not as cool. I needed to be home. I was preparing for this, my teenager, preparing for PSATs. My point is, I would have never missed a dinner 10 years, 15 years ago. I would have never missed a dinner. It's networking, it's dinner, it's, right? My life's changed. My priorities have changed. What I need to do has changed, right? That's our employees. Our managers need to help them with those changes with those conversations. Just because someone said they wanted to do that two years ago doesn't mean they still want to do it. Doesn't mean they're capable of doing it. And just as they said they didn't want to do it, doesn't mean they don't want to do it now. Employee development, that's why it's exciting. It changes. People change. We want to make sure they're prepared on the journey. They have all the tools they need and that they know it matters to us. 
their development matters to us. And we just want to make sure we help our managers do that. So I think, I think I'm done. Oh, Lord. See, yeah, that's a squiggly slide. All right, I want to thank you. You've been incredibly gracious. You've been very participative. And I've now led you to lunch, which I've heard is fabulous. So any quick questions before I hop down? Do we have any questions for Margie? Oh, yep. You don't. Not at all, no. Thank you for that presentation. It was outstanding. And of course, it, it peppered all of us with a lot of different ideas. My question is, with an, in an organization where we don't have disposable income and we don't have a very large leadership team, how do you recruit those, uh, recruit those mentors and sponsors? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, so it's hard. You gotta, you've got to dig, dig deep. Go ask people personally. Like, we have gone and asked, I'm looking at my team, We've literally gone and said, you know, this is important. Can you please do this? We'll give you the limited time you need to do it, right? We'll help you. I mean, sometimes in our job as HR, it's hard, right? It's hard. You get, you'll, we'll do all the work. We'll help you, you know, with everything you need. Appeal to them. You know, in some cases, I just say, hey, this, you're, you're a leader. Leaders lead. You know, it's the last resort that I use. Um, but start small. And maybe when people see the success of it, and then I'm big, I'm, I'm a shameless self-promoter of my team. Highlight the successes, highlight the mentors, give them credit, give them visibility. Sometimes that's the best way to get other people to jump on the wagon. Say that it's, you know, we, we highlight in people's performance reviews if they're mentors, it means something. It impacts their career trajectory. So there's a little bit of a carrot and a stick with it, but I hear you. And not everyone wants to commit that time to it either. Those are just some things we've tried. I definitely think holding people up and showing how important it is sometimes gets people to jump on the bandwagon. And you get a mug. Any other questions? Oh, yep. Joel. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was wonderful. Thank you. So my question is, a lot of organizations will ask often senior leaders or leaders or managers who, of color to participate on committees to represent and those individuals because of their they value representation will never say no mm -hmm. and there's there is a overall philosophy of representation but how do we get that that philosophy of representation to be sh shifted to getting more organizational representation or more diversity within the organization so that it's not those same people yep. who are the representatives and and then sometimes isolated within their organizations. So I'm, my whole team is the usual suspects, right? So the people, you know, we, I can think of our five minority employees that are on everything, that do everything, and we find ourselves going to the same names, you know, even though we have a lot of minority employees. Um, so the more employees you have, the bigger net you can cast. So first is have more minority representation in general. Then you're not going back to the same people. Here again, recruit. Recruit, and I'm looking, um, I'm looking at Jackie Dalton, who's our chief diversity officer. She'll go talk to, we have an allyship program that, that she started, right, that's specifically about creating allies for minority employees and then building the bridge. She'll go talk to someone, hey, we don't see you at this. It'd be great if you were here. You want to advance your career? Be a part of this. And so we don't get the usual suspects because it's easy to go to the usual suspects. And then other people aren't developing. They think it's a click. It does the opposite of what you're trying to do. So sometimes it's just good old fashioned recruiting and it's also people seeing other folks will feel more comfortable. We've heard minorities say, well, we just know who's gonna get picked or we know who's gonna get that. So back to it's kind of some legwork and the relationship work, but the more you do it, you'll see more people be willing to jump on board. Was there anything that you would add to that, Jackie? No, okay. So we have um, a question. How do you engage remote workers? Oh my lord! So it's funny. I, um, it's I, so I before I came to the Fed, I was at Vitamix and I was at Siemens. Siemens is huge. You would never be a remote worker back when I was. So it, it took me a while during the pandemic. Thanks, Jolene. I love your name. Um, it took me a while, even as the head of HR, to think, okay, how are we going to do this? We it's meeting them where they are, but let me give you more structure around that. So we do require. We, we encourage managers to require people coming in 
for certain things. So my whole staff has to be in every Tuesday morning for my staff meeting. I don't care any other day that you're in, but you have to be in Tuesday mornings. I want a face-to-face -face staff meeting. Now, there's times that won't work. Someone's got a kid, someone's got an illness, someone's got a meeting, right? It won't work. Um, but I think encouraging some face-to-face -face interaction is okay. Now, people said, what about fully remote? Fully remote, you have to spend more time. I just think that's the truth of it. You have to teach managers to spend more time, right? You can't, because you're missing the small talk before the meeting. You jump right on. People get on and off. They're distracted. I see people. I mean, I'm one of them. I'm on a remote call, and I'm multitasking. So we've created some rules of engagement that we use at the Fed. We've literally said you need to be on your camera. You know, you need to keep multitasking to a minimum. I mean, people are grown-ups, right? But we've also created a program that we're happy to share on managing hybrid employees and how you use some different tactics that you can use as a manager to engage them more. But it takes more work. I'm, in, my, in my opinion, so this is a non-Fed. This is where it's Margie. It takes more work, I think, to engage hybrid workers or remote workers because you have to be more intentional in doing it, but you can do it. And then you need to put some of the burden on the employee to do their part as well. And we have met with some success with kind of putting those rules of engagement out there. We have one more question. Yep. OK. We, we are looking to start a mentoring program. And I was wondering, do you use an app to manage that? Or how is that managed? We have about, um, well, Across the company, we have almost 10,000 people, but I'm thinking about probably about four to 5,000 people would be our goal across the United States. Um, but even at our corporate office or our Canton Support Center, we have about 400 people. How do you manage that, you know, as far as who's interested in the pairing? So we do not have an app. Um, we're much smaller, so we manage it all internally. Um, I would advise having an app or a program or someone you know technical creating something. I don't think, I mean, you need the technology probably for the map and the communication. You don't need it, I don't think, for the blocking and tackling of the program. Um, but no, we don't, we don't have a population that big. It's all done manually. I mean, it's tracked and we have systems, but it's, there's no app. But if you do create an app, we'd love to see it. <laughs> I love stealing people's work shamelessly with credit, with credit. So where are you from, ma'am? Great, thank you. And there's a notepad for you. I'm not going to walk down there again. That was terrifying. Are we good? <laughs> thank you all so, so much. Thank you.